So welcome to this quick video around Windows Server 2016 failover clustering as it stands in technical preview three. And really what this is, is a series of demonstrations. I'm actually about to speak at a conference connections in Vegas. And I wanted to make a video of some of the demos just in case things go wrong. And I thought, well, I'm doing it. I might as well make it kind of a demonstration that I can upload to the YouTube channel. Now this is not exhaustive. I'm not talking about rolling upgrades. I'm not talking about um, no domain membership requirements for clusters. I'm not talking in detail about the cloud witness or even storage replica. What I want to focus really on is the compute and storage resiliency, some of the troubleshooting capabilities and the new storage spaces direct capability, kind of like a vSAN. So let's actually start with that resiliency. And what I have in this first demonstration are three physical boxes. And you can see here, I've got my three nodes. And in this cluster, I'm actually using a cloud witness. This is a new Windows Server 2016 feature. So for my quorum, it could be a disk witness, a file share, or now I can actually use an Azure storage account. I just need the storage account name and the storage key. And it goes and creates a container within the storage account. And that's what it now leverages for a vote. So this is very useful. Imagine I had a multi-site cluster and I didn't have maybe a file share that was in a third location. So Azure could now be that third location. So I'm using the Azure Cloud Witness. So I've got three nodes and all I have in this cluster are four virtual machines. I've got one on each node and then a fourth one running on the third node. Now the first three virtual machines are all running on my cluster shared volume. So if I go to my C drive, go to my cluster storage, you can see I've got VM one, two, and three. Now the fourth virtual machine is actually running on an SMB file share. It's on a scale out file server. This is because what I want to demonstrate in here are two things, compute resiliency and storage resiliency. So here you can see the VMs actually running on a scale out file server. Because what I want to show is, well, what happens if this, for example, node falls out of cluster membership? And what happens if it loses access to its storage? And I'm going to show both of these in one go. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take node three out of the cluster by crashing its cluster service. Now, what would happen in Windows Server 2012, as soon as a node went out of the cluster, it loses quorum, any resources on it would be seized by other nodes in the cluster. Now, why that's a problem is imagine it was a transient failure, a transient network blip that was just a few seconds, but it resulted in the node dropping out the cluster and all its VMs would be restarted on other nodes as it was a transient loss of the storage. Again, the VM would crash because it loses access and it would have to restart up. So small transient errors would actually introduce a large downtime. If I have a network blip and I fall out of quorum for a few seconds, but the result of that is all the VMs have to restart on other nodes in a crash consistent state, they're not neatly live migrated, then that could be five minutes to restart those. So five minutes of downtime because of a couple of second transient blip. So Windows Server 2016 changes this with compute and storage resiliency. So compute resiliency says, if I fall out of the cluster, but I can still get to the storage, so that would be this fourth scenario because it's on a scale out file server, the VM will carry on running. And it will carry on running for four minutes. So hopefully any transient problems would resolve themselves in four minutes. The storage resiliency says, look, if I lose access to my storage, instead of just crashing, letting the guest OS crash, I'm gonna put it into a paused critical state. So I'm gonna freeze any operations it does and wait until the storage comes back. And at that point, I'll unfreeze it and it should be able to carry on and go on its way. So those two things together make clustering far more resilient to any kind of transient problem. So this is actually looking on node one if I flip over to node three, I have kind of the same view and I can see the VMs as well running on this node. So what I'm gonna do, this is gonna happen very quickly. Go to my task manager and I see the cluster service. Now it's gonna auto restart within 30 seconds. So I don't have long to see this problem happen. So I'm gonna kill it. 
And what we'll see is this is now gone into pause critical. This is storage resiliency because it loses access to the cluster shared volume. If I go to the original node, the VMs now show unmonitored and the node is now isolated because it can't talk to it. But it knows that it's now unmonitored, the VMs running on it. And I can see that VM that's on the scale out file server, it's carried on running because the node for four minutes is going to carry on running its services. And notice now it just started again that VM3 because the cluster service restarted. If I go task manager, we'll see it started again. So the cluster rejoined and everything's great. So the only outage I took was while that was in paused critical state. So there was no crash of the OS. That transient storage error in this case was a few seconds, and in this case, near 30. So it was just paused. As soon as the storage come back, it resumed again. So here I lost the storage because it was on a CSV and the node fell out of quorum, at which point it loses access to the CSV. The same logic would apply if the node was running fine, but it lost access to its fiber channel, its iSCSI. The VM would go in that paused critical state. As soon as the storage comes back, it resumed. But the compute resiliency, you'll notice, that VM just kept running. Even though it was out of the cluster, rather than having that seized by someone else, it just carried on. As long as it's within that sort of four minute window, everything's fine. Now, what happens if I do it again? What if there's a problem with this node? What if it keeps kind of flapping around and keeps falling out of the cluster? So this is the second time. So my second time, it's going to go into a problem. Depending on how quickly it's going to do it, it goes running critical and it's going to go pause critical when it actually tries to do something. If I go back to my node one again, it's unmonitored. It's already back again. So this time the cluster service started very quickly. And it's just carried on. If I stop it again, So now it's gone pause critical this time, it's out for longer. I've gone to isolated state. Once again, my roles are unmonitored. All the while, that VM4 is quite happy, class service has now restarted. So any second now, what we should see is something different. So why is this happening? Why is it now saving? Because I've had three errors in an hour. So now what it's decided to do is, do you know what? I don't really trust it. So that node has now been quarantined and it will stay quarantined for two hours. Now the way I've actually got it so that migration is queued up so VM3 will move over to one of the other nodes. The way VM4 is set up that I only want that running on three, which is why that's saved. But now it's actually moving the VMs off it's queued up. If I go back to my third one, it's paused. Once that comes back from the storage problem, it would resume and then move over. So that's now quarantine. This is designed to say, look, if a node keeps going in and out in an unplanned state, I don't want that. That's impacting still maybe the availability of my resources. So for two hours, this will now be put in quarantine with the assumption that within the two hours, we're going to fix that problem. When it comes back, it's going to stop flip-flopping around. Now with PowerShell, I can fix that. And also, um, I can do that through the cluster manager as well. See, I'm actually on the box. If I launch my PowerShell, start-cluster node. What I'm going to do is my clear quarantine flag. So it's now going to bring that up. And any second now, that should come out of quarantine and resume again. This is going to take a little while, but that will now come out of quarantine and sort of carry on and get the services back. So that was kind of the first demo. That was the storage resiliency, the compute resiliency, and that quarantine capability, if a node keeps flapping in and out, the ability to actually say, hey, take a time out, have two hours to yourself, 
fix your problems, and then come back and I'll start giving you resources again. The other technology I want to talk about, and remember this is technical preview three, things are still being ironed out, etc., etc. So storage space is direct. Now there is already storage replica in Windows Server 2016. This is the asynchronous or synchronous block level replication of one disk to another disk. And that's fantastic. That can be between servers, um, in a stretch cluster, between clusters, a number of different scenarios. But what about if I have a bunch of direct attached storage within multiple nodes in the cluster, and I want to kind of aggregate all of that together to present itself as maybe a cluster shared volume, or make it available to others as a scale out file server over SMB, kind of like a virtual SAN. So what I have next is I have four virtual machines. Each of these virtual machines have two data disks. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna make those two disks on each node, so eight disks, aggregate together into a storage spaces direct. This will do a three-way mirror between them, so the data is replicated three times within those disks across all four nodes, but it will aggregate up as a single volume. So now I can take direct storage in nodes and make it available to all of them in a resilient fashion so I can use it for Hyper-V virtual machines via clustered shared volumes. I can offer it out as a scale out file server. So here I'm on one of the nodes. And what I'm gonna do is first thing you have to do is enable cluster storage spaces direct. And I've run that already. What it does, it switches this direct attached storage mode and sets it to one. Now I cannot use this and clustered storage spaces in the same cluster, so I have to pick. Once I've done that, I can check what disk could I actually use for this. So this is showing me all the disks I have. And you can see here I have eight 10 gig disks. The next thing I'm gonna do is create it. So I'm gonna create a storage pool. I'm doing my resiliency setting to be mirror. I'm using all those physical disks that I can pull together. So this is creating that storage space is direct. So across all four machines, it's pulling in the two disks from each node. From that, I can now create a virtual disk. Physical disk redundancy is two, so it gives me a three-way mirror. So I'm creating this one using ReFS, the resilient file system. So that's now creating me a virtual disk. And how that's gonna expose itself is on my C cluster storage, I'll now see a volume one. So there we go, there's my volume one. And it's formatting it. If this was Hyper-V, I'd wanna disable the file integrity. Just run that. So now I have this single volume across all four nodes. Even though it's direct attached storage on each node, it's being aggregated together it's using SMB3 internally to communicate the data. It's going to do replication of the data on each of the local, disk to, uh, local disks on other nodes in the cluster. So it's resilient against disk or node failure. And I can just now use Volume 1 to host my virtual machines to create a scale out file server. Now I can kind of view the details of that so I can see the makeup. Here, this is just using a function I've already created up here. And this will show me, so there's four enclosures, one for each of the nodes. So they're where the disks are stored. And then the physical disks are stored in those four kind of virtual enclosures. And each of them have a unique ID for each enclosure. And here I can see the node and the disk it's given. And there's the size. So I can see this single storage so you're made up of those eight disks. But maybe you don't believe me. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use this disks PD tool. And this is really a performance it does, in my case I'm doing 90% writes, 10% reads, over 60 seconds on a five gig file. So it's, create, it's doing that test on that cluster shared volume I just created, that storage space direct called test file. And what I've done is I've created a performance monitor. And here I can see the physical disks one and two 
across all four nodes in the cluster. And this will kind of prove when I start doing an I.O. test, you will see all of those disks because it's doing obviously blocks of data, three copies of everything. So I'm going to start the performance test. And what we'll see is notice all eight disks, two in each node, I'm accessing that one file. This really demonstrates the fact that it's using all of the disks. So it's aggregated them all together. And I could run this from any node in the cluster. It's a cluster shared volume. So this is a fantastic capability. Think of a hyper-converged model now, where I have the compute, the storage networking, just in the nodes. So now I can actually use that local storage across my cluster. I don't maybe have to have a SAN or even a NAS device. I can now just leverage the disks inside my nodes. I'm aggregating it together. It's using SMB3 to communicate between themselves. And I can just put my Hyper-V VMs on that cluster shared volume. So it's all about choice. I can use storage spaces direct to use my direct attached disks. I can have an external storage enclosure connected to multiple nodes and use clustered storage spaces. I have a SAN. Hey, I'll connect to that and use it as a cluster shared volume. I have a NAS that supports SMB3. Hey, I'll use that for my virtual machines. Many, many different options are not restricted to one type of thing. And that's the point. Choice in how you want to organize this. Choice in what you want to do with this. Now, the final thing I just wanted to really show was just some of the cool new troubleshooting capability. So when I sort of just scroll up for a second, so you have these troubleshooting commands. And I had some issues when I was getting this set up. There's some changes. There were some requirements around using storage spaces direct, uh, certain processor functions. So as part of my troubleshooting, I was chatting to some of the product group and they've got these great new commands. This first one, get cluster log. What this does is I run this on one of the nodes and it actually connects to all of the nodes, creates a text document for every node and it pulls together everything you need to know to troubleshoot. So if I open one of these things up and they've got this little TIE fighter um, around each of the different sections. So I can just search for this string to make it easy to jump between them. So I see I have basic information about the node. I can see the resources, the groups, the resource types available. I can see the actual node information. So all the nodes, and it's all in comma separated value format. So I could take this and put it in Excel, for example. I can see my networks. It's giving me the network interfaces, the volumes, the volume logs, the system log, the failover clustering operational log, cluster we're updating admin logs, diagnostic verbose stuff, it captures the cluster logs. All of this stuff just captured for every single node in the cluster. So I run this one command, I get everything. Then there's get cluster diagnostics. This gives even more detailed information. And what this does, it saves it out to a file and it's a big zip file containing huge numbers of different files with all different pieces of information. Again, I can then just share with Microsoft. So some really cool, nice technology has been added. And I really just think it helps us in our sort of everyday. I want to thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed and found this useful. Thank you.